So what is CRISPR? CRISPR is an acronym that stands for the much longer clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, which is a mouthful. But basically what CRISPR is, is it is an immune response that prokaryotic organisms developed to protect themselves against attacks from plasmids or viruses. So what exactly is CRISPR consistent of? Well, CRISPR consists of sequences of prokaryotic DNA which contain repetitive base sequences. And in between those repetitive base sequences are what we call DNA spacers. And that's where CRISPR gets really interesting. Because those DNA spacers, unlike you might first think, don't actually contain any prokaryotic DNA themselves. Instead, they contain the DNA from the foreign attackers, thus the protective mechanism. So, how did this all get discovered? Well, the journey to CRISPR began in 1987, when a scientist named Yoshizumi Ishino, who was studying E. coli bacteria at the time, first noticed this clustering behavior in the bacteria that he was working with. But the science community didn't really think much of it until about 2000, when this was studied a little bit further and was actually given a name, SRSR. But then two years later, in 2002, it was renamed what we now today refer to as CRISPR. And along that same time, we also discovered what we called CRISPR-associated proteins, or CAS proteins for short. And these proteins are essentially enzymes, either nuclease or helicase, that are used to cut up the DNA in the prokaryote of whatever was attacking it. And from there, we kind of took it by storm. And in 2012, that's when the major upheaval from the science community came about in how can we integrate CRISPR into human cell culture. And that's kind of where the journey all began. What you do is you program the CRISPR RNA to bind complementary to your DNA strand that you are working with. And then the protein, called Cas9, recognizes when the CRISPR binds to the DNA strand and then it acts as genetic scissors to cut out a faultily coded DNA sequence and then take away the sequence that is undesired and replace it with either a new sequence or leave it disrupted. So that's what CRISPR does. But this is a little bit more complicated than most people are willing to understand beyond the science community. So when I tell people that I am really interested in CRISPR, I tell people to think of it like autocorrect on your phone. So it's essentially autocorrect for genes. So you're typing a message and you misspell a word. And all of a sudden you hit send and your message makes no sense at all. And the person getting it gets so confused they have no idea what you're saying. And the entire communication gets disrupted between you and whoever you're texting. But instead, autocorrect comes in it identifies that word which you have misspelled and it gives you a correct suggestion which it then places in its space and now all of a sudden the entire sequence or sentence makes complete sense. And so CRISPR, like autocorrect, works in a very similar fashion. But then there's the huge question of what if. There's also the downside the side that we don't know. We don't know as much as we think we do about CRISPR. And that's where a big argument about ethics comes in. People are so excited about the possibility and the potential that CRISPR holds that they forget that there might actually be some downsides to this. And they forget to look into it further. And because it's so new, people are really wary about using it in, for example, embryos or using it in genetic diseases. And there's also agriculture, the potential that we could insert genes or change genes that would help make food more resistant to temperature or not need as much water or nutrients. 
The possibilities are really endless with CRISPR, but we don't know the side effects. We don't know what would happen if we did do that. We've tested it in a bunch of different organisms, such as yeast, we've tested it in mice, in pigs, the list goes on and on. But when you're taking it out of the lab and actually inputting it into a human being or food that will be consumed by humans, the error rate needs to be a lot, lot lower. And especially with CRISPR, we've seen a bunch of different varying error rates. It can range from 0.01% to 60%. And of course, the 0.01% is small, and maybe that could have some potential for future innovation. But still, that's 0.01% that could potentially receive something very, very destructive. So genetics has been a really big topic in the science community as of the past couple of years. It first started with the Human Genome Project and discovering that we have about 20,000 to 25,000 different genes in our genome. And then there's also the fact that 6,000 of those are the causes for genetic mutations and genetic diseases. And what's interesting is that 9 out of 10 of the leading causes of death are caused by genetic mutations in our DNA. And that is scary. But it also shows us that we can pinpoint the cause. We know what's causing it. And that's one more step in the right direction. And CRISPR could help solve a lot of those and fix those. If we all worked together, we could actually discover how to start moving forward in actually progressing gene therapy that will work not only for a few people or a few organisms, but everyone. And that's what's good about CRISPR, is that it is not type specific. And not only that, but it can actually be used for multiple different genes. And it's also really quick. And it's so simple and it's so cheap, which is one of the beautiful things about CRISPR. What's so amazing is no one really knows beyond the science community, but it's going to take everyone to come together and decide, okay, what do we do with this? What regulations do we put in place? How far are we willing to go? And that's where you guys come in. Because CRISPR is a really controversial topic, but it's also a really simple and easily to use product, we need to not only get information from the biggest, most famous scientists in the world or the people that are trying to solve the cure for cancer, we need it from you. We need to further the understanding of how science is progressing in relation to what we're learning in schools. Yes, we learn about DNA, we know that DNA is a short acronym for deoxyribose nucleic acid. But do we know what's going on right now in that whole community? Do we know that there are people out there that are trying to develop this thing called CRISPR that could potentially help us be able to selectively choose what DNA we come up with, what DNA we as humans have in our bodies? We don't. That's the thing. We don't have it integrated into our curriculums. So it's up to the kids for themselves to take the initiative and to look into this more. I mean, we're the next generation. We're the people that are going to be growing up when this is developed further. We're the people whose kids might potentially develop a rare genetic disease and then we want to fix it. We want to go to the end of the earth to fix it. And so we look into this. This is going to be our future. So we need to all come together and we need to have some serious discussions about what we are going to do with CRISPR and what the future of CRISPR will be.